the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is talking to his disciples in chapter 10 about service. And in verse 45, he tells them that even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Today is the day we mark on our calendar when whole nations stop to remember people they never knew volunteered to serve and to give their lives to the many. They put themselves in a position to serve, just like Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Jesus positioned himself to serve. In the book of the Philippians, we read this. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus put himself into the position of a servant. I love how humility is mentioned twice in that verse. Stepping out of the heavenly realms into our world, humbling himself to our place, living amongst us, and then again humbling himself again. Not just to die for us, but to die the death of a criminal. A death that is scorned by people of the society, that first century world. Crucifixion was an embarrassment. Yet Jesus humbled himself on the cross in order that he could serve. As Jesus positioned himself here among us, we would see the same values as shown by our Anzacs. And the first one is courage. In John's Gospel, we read about the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, chapter 11. So Jesus has just come from Jerusalem, and he's currently staying with his disciples on the far side of the Jordan River. When come, news comes to, Lazarus that, uh, to Jesus that Lazarus is sick. And after a couple of days, Jesus tells the disciples that they're going back to Judea, which is where Jerusalem is, back across the Jordan into Bethany, where Lazarus is. For those of you who heard my Easter message or watched it online, remember that I spoke about this very event in relation to Thomas, the disciple. Because when, once Jesus says they're going back to Judea, the disciples are like, uh, Jesus, do you remember a few days ago they tried to kill you there? They got stones out. They actually physically picked up stones to kill you. Do you not remember that? It's only a few days ago, Jesus. Do you, do you not remember? But Thomas goes, let's go and die with Jesus. He was full of energy. In John chapter 10, we read that Jesus was in Jerusalem for Hanukkah. And he's in the temple, and the people are asking him if you're the Messiah. Are you the Messiah, the one God sent? And Jesus explains to them, he speaks to them, and he ends with this. He says, the Father and I are one. He claims equality with God. Well, the people didn't appreciate this too much. The followers of the Pharisees, they were outraged. They couldn't believe that Jesus will claim that he is God. How blasphemous. And so they pick up stones. In verse 31, it says they picked up stones to kill him. At which Jesus doesn't relent. He doesn't step back. He doesn't go, oh, no, I was just kidding. It's all good. It's all kidding. I was just kidding. I didn't mean that. Jesus doubles down. And he says, why are you trying to stone me? And he explains to them the futility of their thinking. And he says, he ends again. He says, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And as they try to grab him to stone him, Jesus escapes with his disciples. And he flees and he goes across to the River Jordan. And he stays there with the disciples. That's where we pick up the story in John 11. And now Jesus wants to go back. He wants to go back to where they tried to kill him. Jesus heads into danger in order that he can resurrect Lazarus from the dead. Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus heads into danger. He knew that going back was dangerous. He knew that raising Lazarus was also dangerous. But Jesus knew that a resurrected Lazarus was an amazing testimony to the power of God and to who he was as the Messiah. Lazarus became a living witness to God's power, to who Jesus was. And many people came to see Lazarus and they believed in Jesus just by seeing Lazarus. And what was the response to the religious leaders? How did they respond? 
So from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. For them, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. They had to get rid of Jesus. Jesus knew he came back into Judea, into Bethany, which is just outside Jerusalem, would put him in harm's way. He knew he would put himself in harm's way. Jesus knew that a powerful miracle like raising Lazarus from the dead would threaten his life. But he was obedient. He knew that Lazarus would become a living testimony to who he was. Jesus was courageous. He was not afraid to obey his father. But do what needed to be done so that people would believe. Jesus shows courage. Jesus also shows mateship. In John 15, we read this in verse 12. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. In Melbourne, there's a war memorial and the Shrine of Remembrance. I don't know if, if anyone's been there. Have you ever been to the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne? Yeah. In the sanctuary, there is a marble stone, the Stone of Remembrance, and upon which is this. It says, Greater love hath no man. That's John 15, 13. The legacy of Jesus' words were the motivation for a generation of soldiers. I value that in Australia we call mateship. It's all we call, we call it mateship. To be there for your friends, to be there for your mates, to support them, to be alongside them, to do what needs to be done because they're your mates. It was mateship that spurred John Fay to storm the beach of Gallipoli. He's the only chaplain to ever run into battle like that, to storm a beach. Jesus' words to his disciples were simple. Love each other, just like I have loved you. Mateship is ingrained in our Australian vernacular. It's part of who we are. It's part of our DNA. But it is a kingdom principle. Mateship is the kingdom principle. Jesus commands us to love our neighbour, to love one another, not just be concerned or have a vague interest. Those things are fine to be interested in other people. But Jesus calls us to more. He wants us to do more. He wants us to love each other just like he loved us. To position yourself to serve each other. To position yourself to love. The church should be the one place in society when anyone can walk through those doors and find love, compassion and mateship. To find friends who are also family, brothers and sisters. Loving like Jesus isn't easy. It's hard to find the time. It's hard to invest the energy. But it is our calling. It's what we are commanded to do. Jesus commands those who follow him to lay down their lives for one another. That is the command upon your life if you follow Jesus. To do no less than Jesus was willing to do. Only in our love will others see the love of Jesus. What did Jesus say? They will know you, you are my disciples, by what? By your love. So let us position ourselves to love others and to show mateship to our friends, our colleagues, our family, our neighbours, whoever, because we are commanded to do so. Jesus shows perseverance. In Hebrews 5, it says this, While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest. And he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings. He persevered. He endured. He was determined. He was resolute. He had a purpose. And he had the resolve to see it through. But perseverance takes effort. It takes will. Jesus never stopped praying. He always kept open lines of communication with his Father. Jesus prayed all night when choosing the twelve that would become his apostles. 
Jesus withdrew from crowds to pray regularly. Jesus prays in the garden for his disciples and for all those who would follow him in the future. Jesus prays on the cross. Jesus persisted in prayer. He pleaded with God the night he was arrested. He persevered in tears. He wept before Lazarus was raised from the dead. That miracle he knew would be the final catalyst that would see him arrested and crucified. Jesus cries as he enters Jerusalem for the final time. Tears hearing the song sung that glorify God. Hosanna, Hosanna. But knowing that in less than a week they would turn on the Son of God. In Psalm 126 verse 5 it says, Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Jesus persevered in prayer. He sowed with tears. He endured in obedience. Jesus did as the Father asked, even though it cost him his life. Anzac Day is the commemoration of perseverance and obedience. People enduring hardship and following orders, even though it cost them greatly. And because of their perseverance, the war eventually came to an end. Jesus persevered. And so God lifted him up to become our representative before him. He becomes our source of eternal salvation when we obey him. Jesus lays the platform for us that we would persevere, that we would never stop praying, we would persist in prayer, that we would sometimes understand we need to sow in tears, that living for Jesus and loving others takes an emotional toll, but we need to persevere. It's what we're called to do, and we need to be obedient. Because if we persevere, we will reap songs of joy. That is the promise. And lastly, Jesus is our sacrifice. There's no more fitting way to finish with the value of sacrifice. In World War I, over 62,000 Australian and over 58,000 New Zealand men died. The Anzacs gave 120,000 lives in World War I alone. That's a monumental sacrifice for two countries to endure. We would like to say that was it, that no more lives needed to be lost, that the Great War would be the last war. But we know that wasn't the case. Service personnel continue to this day to give their lives for their country. So while one sacrifice continues to be paid, there is another sacrifice. That remains eternal. Jesus came to end the need for sacrifice. To pay for the sins of everyone forever. Perfectly paving the way for everyone to know their God. We continue to pay one sacrifice with our people. But Jesus came to end sacrifice for eternity. I'm going to read a portion of scripture from Hebrews 10. It's quite long. But there's no better way to say what Jesus did on the cross than by this. It explains it perfectly, what Jesus had to do and why he had to do it. In Hebrews 10, we read from verse 1. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again year after year, but they were never able to provide a perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided a perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worships would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You are not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, Look, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written about me in the Scriptures. So first Christ said, 
He did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burn offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, Jesus said, Look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. He does away with that old system of sacrifices that just reminded the people of their sins in order to put a new covenant in place. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest, that is Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down at the place of honour at God's right hand. And there he waits until his enemies are made humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Being made perfect. That is what we are. Being made perfect and holy. There is no better explain what Jesus did. If you ever wonder what Jesus did on the cross and why he did it, just read Hebrews 10, 1-14. It explains explains everything. He has forever made you perfect in the eyes of God. Anzac Day is about memory and sacrifice. The sacrifice of those who position themselves to serve. That is the legacy of their sacrifice. Never forgotten that they put themselves in the position to give their very lives. Just south of the River Somme in northern France is the town of Vieux Boutonneau. That's as good as my French gets, by the way. It was in this little town that the diggers had one of their greatest World War I victories. The enemy force had launched a major offensive to take the French town of Amiens. And in the process, the town of Vieux Boutonneau was captured. The British feared that if Amiens was taken, the war would be lost. They would gain too much ground. So the job of recapturing Vieux Boutonneau was given to two Australian brigades. So they circled the town and launched a surprise attack. No preemptive strike, none of that. They surrounded the town, and at 10 p.m. on the 24th of April, 1918, they attacked. Surprise attack at night time. It was do or die. They either won or they all perished, and the war was lost. It was a ferocious battle. On the 25th of April, three years after that first landing at Gallipoli, the French and Australian flags were raised over the town of Vie Boutonneau. One British general described the Anzac attack as probably the greatest individual feat of the war. But it came at a cost. 1,200 soldiers lost their lives. It was a sacrifice, but one that had lasting results. The French townspeople have never forgotten the sacrifice made for them. An Australian flag still flies over that town. Outside the town hall is a plaque that tells the story of the events of that night. Kangaroos feature in the town hall's entrance. The main street is named Rue de Melbourne. (laughs) And after the war, school children in Victoria donated money to rebuild the school in Vie Bretonneau. Across the front of the building, it says, do not forget Australia. I think you've got a photo somewhere. I don't know if it's, there it is. Do not forget Australia. That's the town. That's the kids of that school. It says, solidarity with our friends, the Australians. A hundred years later. A hundred years later. They still remember. Sacrifice brings a legacy. The people have never forgotten what was done there. So what does the legacy of sacrifice mean for us? What does it mean for us? 
We are positioned to serve. We are positioned to serve. We now have a legacy to step into. The old system, as Hebrews stated, only gave God's people a dim preview of the good things that were to come. But we live in those good things. We live post-Jesus, post-crucifixion. We have life eternal. Jesus was given a body to offer and he surrendered to God's will and now we are made holy and perfect through Jesus. That is our position. Perfectly placed to do God's will. Just as Jesus did. We are positioned to bring the peace of Jesus to others. The white poppy you were given this morning on the way in is a symbol for peace. It it represents the striving to achieve peace, that war is meant to bring peace. That is what the white poppy represents, peace. Jesus' message was one of peace. The people expected their Messiah, their chosen one, to bring war against their oppressors. That's what they wanted. He was going to drive out the Roman Empire. But Jesus came to bring peace. What did he say? I have not come to be served. I have come to serve. And in serving, he made peace between God and his people. We have been placed in serving God, living our lives with Jesus as the foundation, positioned to show others how much God loves them, to let them know that we can have peace, to tell others about the sacrifice that he made. Sacrifice is understood in our society. People understand sacrifice in our country. People in record numbers turn out to remember the sacrifice made for them. They get what sacrifice is. But they also need to know about the sacrifice of Jesus. They also need to know what Jesus has done for them. That it wasn't free, but it gives them freedom to live forever. To live a life of purpose. To be made holy and perfect before God. Jesus' sacrifice has brought people into peace with their creator. That is what Jesus has done for you. He has given you eternal life. He has given you purpose. He is making you holy and perfect before your creator. As we come to a close, I want to do two things. I'd like us to share in a minute's silence for those who have served their nation, who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And then I want to share in communion together to remember he who sacrificed himself so we can have peace with God. I ask that you bow your heads and just remember what what those men and women have served who gave their lives for you to enjoy the freedoms that you have. That the freedoms you have weren't in fact not free. Let us remember. They shall not grow old, as we are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, or the years condemn. We will remember them, lest we forget. I ask you to take your communion now, as you remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus said in Hebrews, You have given me a body to offer. Let us eat and drink now, in remembrance of him, who humbled himself on a cross, so that we could live. Let us eat and drink.
I'm going to ask the band to come up. I'm going to close in prayer this morning. That we would leave this place humbled, but also thankful for the sacrifice given for us. That we would live lives that reflect what Jesus has done for us. To tell other people about the peace that we have because of Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank that he came and he took the body you gave him. The body that was to be offered to you on the cross. That he was willing to go to the cross for us. That he was obedient. Lord, we thank you for the values of the Anzacs, the values of Jesus. We thank you for courage. We pray, Lord, that each one person here will be courageous. That we would have the courage to speak about you, speak about Jesus, to tell them what you mean to us, to share our testimony with people. That we would show mateship. That we would stand alongside people, be their friends, be their brothers, be their sisters. That we would persevere. That we would understand that you commanded us to love one another to love other people, that we would persevere. Even though it's difficult and takes a toll on us, that we would lay down our lives, that we would persevere in prayer, that we would continue to speak to you, speak with you and listen to you and follow your direction. And Lord, we thank you for sacrifice. We thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for us. We thank you that we Enjoy the freedoms today because of the price that was paid. Help us to live a life worthy of the sacrifice that was made, a life of joy and happiness because we have been set free. That Jesus did away with that old system, that old covenant, those things that were just day after day and year after year, that all they did was remind people how bad they were. It reminded people of their sins. That Jesus came to do away with that, and instead offered once and for all a way that we could know you, God, to have peace with you, to live a life of purpose, to live a life forever. Lord, we thank you this morning, for you are good. We thank you for the lives given to us, our soldiers and service personnel. Pray, Lord, you will be with the families this morning as they remember. Help people in our world, to understand what sacrifice means and help us to emulate those who have given their lives for us. We thank you and we pray. Amen.